Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center for today's uh, mission status briefing, uh, following along with Discovery's arrival at the International Space Station as part of the STS-133 uh, mission. Joining us is Brian Lunny. He's the lead flight director for Discovery's voyage to the ISS, and uh, he'll talk about his shift today, uh, what occurred, obviously, and then look ahead at uh, what's in store for uh, the next day aboard the orbiting joint complex. I'll turn it over to Brian. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. As Kyle said, it's uh, been a great day in space. Uh, the crew has done a fabulous job. I'll walk through some of the activities that went on today as well as talk about how the systems are doing. Uh, first off, the crew got up about uh, 5.50 this morning, just before 6 a.m. Central Time. Uh, they did their typical post-sleep activities, uh, and then we followed up with a a couple of big rendezvous burns. I say big because we went from an orbit of about 120 nautical miles and all the way up to about 190 miles in a, in a one rev transfer with a couple of burns there. And that set us up for the rendezvous and then the docking, all of which went uh, really well. The rendezvous itself was flown really well. All the burns, all the manual maneuvers, all the activities, the crew did a fabulous job. Uh, accomplishing all those things. I didn't get any numbers in terms of propellant consumption, but uh, from my observations, everything went really, really well. Uh, the manual phase, we did the, the RBAR pitch maneuver once we got in close and got some good pictures, we hope, I expect, of the uh, bottom of the space shuttle. Those were being downlinked uh, as I was coming over here. And we'll get a, folks will get a good look at those tonight uh, as, as they come in. And then uh, once the rendezvous pitch maneuver was complete, or our bar pitch maneuver was complete, the crew flew up to the V bar, uh, the velocity vector of the space station, and flew it on in for docking. Uh, the, all the flying, the manual flying, again, went really well. Uh, there were no issues at all with any of the systems on board uh, Discovery. She performed quite well as well. Um, once we got docked, uh, it took a little bit longer than we would have liked for the hard mate to complete. When the orbiter Discovery came in, uh, we got a, what we call a soft dock, and then it took about an extra 30, 40 minutes to get to fully hard mated, and I'll go into why here in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I'll go ahead and cover the rest of the activities for today. Um, for today, you probably saw the crew was opening the hatch. They're coming in, they're gonna do their safety briefing, and then they're gonna get right into their uh, robotic operations that are scheduled for today. Today was a very busy day, and we knew that going into it. This is probably our one day in the timeline that was pretty aggressively scheduled on the timeline purpose. Um, so the crew's gonna go in, and the purpose of the rest of today is to install the ELC number four out on uh, the starboard truss. To do that, they're going to pluck it out of the payload bay with the space station robotic arm. Then that's going to present it to the shuttle robotic arm, uh, who will, uh, they'll do a handoff to the shuttle robotic arm. And then while the shuttle robotic arm is holding the payload, the space station robotic arm is going to do a walk off from the node two and uh, inchworm over to the MBS. And then the spa uh, space shuttle robotic arm will hand it back to the space station arm. And then the space station robotic arm will continue with the installation out at the uh, S3 location. Uh, the crew that's doing this is Nicole Stott and Mike Barrett are doing all of the SSRMS ops, the station arm ops, and Eric Bow and Al Drew are doing the shuttle arm ops. Uh, once it's out at the proper location, it will be attached with the common attached system, the CAS, and Katie and Paula will execute the uh, procedures to do the full hookup for that uh, element out there on the uh, truss. Uh, they should complete all those things uh, just about an hour or so before sleep per the timeline. We were about 40 minutes late or so getting hard mate. The crew made up probably half of that getting the hatch open. So I would anticipate things go well and they will still be able to get everything done uh, today and good, good amount of time and uh, be able to get all made it up uh, before they go to bed. For the docking, the thing that delayed us a little bit, uh, some of you probably saw, once we got to a soft mate, uh, we, the ring is extended uh, that the orbiter contacts um, the station with, and then we try to retract that ring, uh, and the mechanical systems that do that uh, bring it in slowly and carefully, and it wants to be aligned, we want it to be aligned well with the docking interface. Uh, what happened to us this time is uh, it took a little bit longer, and the rates on the vehicle were such that we got uh, tilted over, or pitched over, if you will, a little bit, and then the gravity gradient, what we call the gravity gradient, the forces from the earth, from the gravity, uh, pull a little bit differently on the different masses of the vehicle, believe it or not. So the forces on the shuttle caused it to pitch a little bit more, which uh, differently than the space station. The result is, is that the uh, 
uh, alignment system or the, the docking system gets a little bit out of a line. So we got to wait until we kind of swing. And in this case, we, the shuttle came in in this direction. We got docked on the soft mate. And then it kind of swung all the way around. And by the time you got back over here, the forces were reversed. And we had enough time for the docking system did its passive alignment and kind of fixed itself and got itself aligned again. And then we we're able to do the ret final retraction and get all hard mated. That activity added about 40 minutes. It's about a rev <laughs> as these things work out, or half a rev, excuse me, as these things work out. And uh, we have seen it a couple of times before, actually more than that. We saw it a number of times earlier in the space station program. Uh, and then we kind of changed our procedures and how we do those alignments and retractions. And recently we've seen it on, I think, STS 126 and 130. Um, so there were some who were suspecting perhaps it was an Endeavor thing. Uh, since obviously Discovery just had the same issue, perhaps that's not such a good suspicion anymore. But we'll continue to look at that. The overall impact to us is, is nil. Uh, we lost a little bit of time on the timeline. Uh, the crew will likely make that up. Uh, and if they don't, well, we do have a contingency plan in place that if we didn't get all the way mated in a doc, uh, with the ELC tonight, that we could just leave it at the pre-install position overnight and then pick that activity up in the morning. So there's a fair amount of margin in the timeline to deal with a big contingency like that. I said it was an aggressive timeline for tonight, but there's margin tomorrow that we can use if we had to. But again, I don't think we're going to need to do that. I think that the folks will get it all taken care of on board. And as you saw when they came in the door on the TVs, uh, the crew looked like they were doing great. Listening to them all, all day long, uh, they're in great shape, great spirits, and obviously very happy to be on board the station. Uh, maybe go have some snacks with their friends, like a pineapple or something good like that. We'll see. But um, that's about all I got for today. Or if y'all have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, great. Any questions over here? Robert. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, before you even got to SoftMate, uh, the crew was running, I guess, about four minutes behind in the docking schedule, which they made up for, and then some. Um, I was just curious what caused that delay. Well, the docking is all a manual activity, right? The fly in, the fly around, all that stuff. So the times we put in there are all estimates. So plus or minus a few minutes to me is still on time. Uh, it's like if you say, well, it's going to take me 10 minutes to drive across town. <laughs> you hit a traffic light or something, maybe it takes a little longer, a little shorter. Uh, but you fly a little different rate, a little different style. That'll change your times a little bit. Uh, to us, it's no impact. We know all that margin's in the timeline. And uh, again, for me, it's a manual phase. So plus or minus a few minutes is uh, insignificant. Anything else? Pete, OK. Uh, let's see, we have a couple folks on the phone bridge. We'll start with Marsha Dunn with Associated Press. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, um, Brian, um, I'm just wondering the slight misalignment. Does, does that have anything to do with the, I guess it doesn't have anything then to do with the size of the space station or with all those vessels docked there? Uh, I would agree it does not have anything to do with that. Uh, the misalignment, when we docked, we got lined up just fine. And, and it's more just, it, the vehicle is very large. Station is very large now. And as, we, as, the, as the small rates on the vehicle, uh, allowed it, I guess I was going this way earlier, allowed it to pitch over a little bit. Again, the gravity gradient just accelerated that and also kind of contorted or twisted or just misaligned it a little bit more. And it's just a little bit, but it was enough that uh, it was aligned such that we didn't want to pull it together and not have a good mate. So you wait for it to get cleaned up on the other side and it was aligned well. Uh, if you had a smaller vehicle, uh, probably May not happen, but I can't say that. I don't think we have a real strong theory how why it happens. Like I said, we had it back as early as STS-105, I think someone told me. And again, the procedures back then were a little bit different. Um, would it happen again if we ran those same procedures? I'm not sure. We think what we do today is better. But um, nah, I would say it's just the way it is. It's physics, and uh, we got to deal with that. And we have procedures to deal with that. Do you have any uh, idea of how many, the numbers of pictures, photos that were downloaded following the RPM maneuver? No, I don't. I'm sorry. A bunch. Um, uh, the cruise usually takes on the order of 90 or 100, if I remember right, but uh, they try and get two or three shots of each location on the shuttle, so they get a bunch, and we'll have that number for you tomorrow, though. Great. Thank you. And last one for me. Is there anything new on the uh, debris report from launch day? 
Uh, let's see, from launch day. No, I don't know. Uh, Leroy, uh, had, Leroy Kane had the mission management team today. From what I understand, there wasn't much reported at that time, although I was busy doing the rendezvous at the time. Um, they will get more status as they go. Uh, the timeline for those activities, as we explained yesterday, is tonight they'll have their, what we call the focused inspection meeting, which just means that the folks have had a time to look at all the pieces of imagery from the launch day to flight day two inspection to the Arbar pitch maneuver pictures we take in downlink tonight, today. They'll have a chance to look at all those things and be able to determine if there's some place that we're really worried about. And uh, from what I'm hearing right now, no one obviously is saying any such thing, but we'll have that official meeting tonight. And then the MMT will discuss it tomorrow and as need be for subsequent days as well. Thank you. That's all for me. Okay. Thanks, Marcia. Let's see. James Dean, Florida Today. Are you on? Yes. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Um, Brian, I know you've been uh, focused on the work at hand, but just wondered if you could share any thoughts on uh, seeing Discovery docked for what should be the last time and, and um, as well. Um, just the uh, uniqueness this time of, of joining all the other vehicles. Okay, well, yeah, sure. Uh, Discovery is a, a fabulous, a glamorous vehicle, if you will. Uh, Discovery's done a lot of great things for us, and it's wonderful to see Discovery back at the International Space Station. I did delay coming over here for 15 minutes so I could see the, my crew come into Space Station because it was a personal thing. I wanted to see them there. And I also knew that you guys wanted to see that instead of me. So I really did want to see that. It's good to see our guys on board. It's good to see the spaceship there and to see the whole stack up there. Is, uh, it's all good. We're glad to be flying. Thanks. Um, I uh, wondered if you could just sort of preview the highlights for tomorrow, which uh, generically looks mostly like transfer on the uh, TV schedule. And, and then just one other question was uh, following up again on the fly around. I wonder if you could just uh, tell us kind of what is left to be um, decided to, you know, no, I know, I know the approval is not expected till Monday or Tuesday, but you know, what, what are the outstanding issues that have to be, um, that haven't yet been covered? Thank you. Okay. For flight day four, you're right. It's mostly a transfer and prepare for the EVAs the next day. We'll go into camp out in the evening. Of course, they'll do a bunch of transfer operations during the day. Uh, no real big ticket items at one point in the timeline. That was the day we did the PM install. But do the activity as an EVA-1, we pushed the PMN install to flight day six. So no real um, single big ticket items, if you will. But uh, tomorrow's a big transfer day. Crew gets situated there in space station and be ready to go with the EVAs on flight day five. For the flyabout, I call it the flyabout to distinguish from fly around, which is what the shuttle does after undock, just to keep things straight in my mind when I speak with people. Uh, what is left? Uh, well, when we launched, I kind of unplugged for that conversation and left that to the mission management team. I know that the, and, and the other engineering teams working all the analysis going on, I know that the solar array evaluations and a lot of the evaluations that the International Space Station engineering team has to do on a regular basis for events like this is still in work, and we knew that would take time. Um, it's just a partially iter iterative process, but once they have a solution they like, then they got to go do some more thorough analysis on that to make sure it's going, all the solar ray positioning and things like that are going to be satisfactory. So we knew that part would take a while. Uh, in fact, it might not even be done by flight day six. Uh, the reality is, is that may go a little bit longer, and that's okay because our expectation with the mission management teams is that they would authorize, assuming they get there when they have these discussions, if they authorize the ops teams to go ahead and do this, uh, we will wait for that analysis, of course. And if it came back uh, not good or that there was a problem, that could veto the activity itself. Don't expect that. Uh, folks are working on that, but that is one reality of the timeline and the path we're on. As far as other folks, so the engineering, the space station engineering folks are off looking at uh, the things that they have to do for these type of events, in particular with solar rays. But in addition, the, our Russian partners are also off working on the 24S, making sure they're comfortable with it, doing this activity with the trajectory the crew is being asked to do uh, and all the training and, and flyabout activities that they would have to do during the activity. The uh, early discussions, obviously, we laid out a plan. Uh, here's how it would go happen, and the Russians have done that for us. Now teams on all sides are looking at it, making sure it's a good plan and that uh, there's nothing that we're missing in all of that and that it's going to be safe to go do. So. That is all in work, and again, I think all those reports are going to feed back into the mission management teams over the next couple of days, 
Again, I've asked that they provide us a response no later than flight day six, so we have plenty of time to work it into our operational timeline. Anything else, James? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're back here. Any wrap-ups from anybody? Okay, uh, we'll end with the usual couple of programming notes. Um, crew heads to bed a little before 10 p.m. Central Time. We'll start our flight day three highlights. Obviously, that'll uh, focus on all of the footage that uh, the crew has shot and what you saw of uh, rendezvous and docking. Uh, wake up uh, Sunday is 5.53 a.m. Central Time and uh, the crew will have its first in-flight interview with a number of uh, news organizations uh, tomorrow and uh, there is a mission status briefing scheduled uh, late tomorrow morning and then uh, the MMT of course meets again at one o'clock and we will have a post uh, MMT press conference tomorrow as well that currently is scheduled for 3 p.m. Central so stay tuned for all of that. We're operating off of revision C on the uh, mission television schedule so be sure to uh, check that out. It changes frequently, and uh, you see that there on the bottom of your screen. So uh, check that out along with uh, all of the other mission coverage out on www.nasa.gov. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.